Okay, <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good uh, day to all of you who, have, who were able to join. This is another webinar in a series of webinars by Neurovest and our data partners. Uh, today, I'm really excited to welcome um, Martine Nelson from, uh, from Dow Jones and Newswires. She's the product strategy director of news analytics. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with the team over at Dow Jones, and we have some exciting things to share with you today. The um, context of uh, today's webinar is detecting regime change using news sentiment. Uh, today, what I've done is I brought some of my colleagues uh, from Neurovest. I'm joined by Eric Davidson, who is uh, managing uh, our data relationships and uh, a director within our company. Uh, and also Otar Sepper, who is a senior quant, as well as Tarun Bhatia, who is also a senior quant. Both Otar and Tarun will be participating today and uh, tell you from the ground up, you know, quants um, usually tell the story the way it is. <laughs> no sales and no nuances. So you'll get the story from the, from the core as to what they're doing and what they're working on. Uh, pretty exciting new uh, two case studies that we are going to be covering uh, today. Um, so let's get uh, down to it. Uh, just logistics and some, uh, you know, uh, compliance uh, terminology. Everything you see today uh, in this webinar is hypothetical. It's uh, not an advice to buy or sell any securities. Uh, obviously, any of these uh, strategies contain uh, risk and uh, are not uh, necessarily a recommendation for us of how to invest and what to invest. We are simply showcasing some of our research in progress. Uh, these are not available products that are currently available for sale, but we think it's really important to understand how um, one can use sentiment in news context to really provide informative decisions about investment and how we can use it for two separate use, use cases. So the first use case is basically building um, a sector rotation strategy this is an interesting approach by using a bottom-up aggregation of new sentiment from individual securities, stock picking as they call it, and all the way up to industry level and sector correlation level. Um, after we've done um, that part of the case study, we will actually um, move on to a separate, interesting, very apropos to today's market, um, systematic approach to trading volatility. Um, and obviously, the nature of the market uh, since the beginning of this year has been totally different than what you've seen in years past, uh, since 2008, actually. And it's really interesting to see how you can use uh, a longer term view from new sentiment at aggregate level to identify um, opportunities to trade the volatility and the VIX specifically. So I hope you'll enjoy it. And I hope you'll ask a lot of questions. There's a Q&A icon on the webinar dashboard. Feel free to send out questions as we go through. And uh, we'll try and tackle those during the webinar as well as uh, at the end of the QA session. All right, let's get, uh, get underway. Just about uh, Neurovest, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we have an interesting business model. We basically, um, um, our mission is to, to uh, allow... Uh, professional investment uh, businesses, enterprises to utilize machine learning and data science to make more informed decisions and build algorithmically traded strategy. This is adaptive AI, which means uh, the notion of changes in market regime can be adapted automatically by the models using data and using machine learning techniques. We'll talk about those things today. Um, we basically um, have two uh, business uh, kind of models, we invest our own capital in some strategies and we build thematic portfolios that we offer to outside uh, financial um, um, professionals to uh, use that technology um, as another arrow in their quiver, another product. So that's what we do. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Um, I want to pass the baton here to uh, Martine Nelson, who can tell us a little bit more about Dow Jones. <laughs> the name obviously um, stands on its own, but Martine, please uh, give us uh, some background. Thank you so much, Eris. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. 
Um, so Dow Jones uh, has been a leading provider of real-time financial news for 125 years with uh, global multi-asset coverage. And our mission really is to be a source of truth for the community, uh, looking to serve a broad range of investment models. We're very, very happy to be partnering with Nervest. Uh, obviously, their expertise in AI and machine learning I think is without question. Um, but one of the things that I love most is their ability to be creative uh, and their willingness to explore new ideas in, pursuit, in the pursuit of robust uh, strategies. I think this webinar is a great example of that. Um, Nervous has been working with our text feed and archive uh, since the partnership began. And uh, I'm very excited to, to hear what they have to say and share the work that they've done with everyone on the two use cases with you uh, today. Thank you, Martin. Uh, likewise, it's a pleasure working with your team and uh, your data is obviously, you'll see very soon, uh, very effective. Um, let's talk about, uh, in general, what, what's the need for automating and using machine learning uh, or more specifically natural language processing, NLP, to read uh, and identify sentiment and contextual sentiment within, uh, within free text, right? Because this is what we consume uh, from uh, from Dow Dow Jones, you can see on the right side this little distribution of number of articles that could come in, um, you know, on a daily basis. So you can see on average there's about 250. Uh, obviously, we have a lot more, um, but sometimes over a thousand, or fifteen hundred, and even two thousand. Just imagine the magnitude of number of articles a human would have to read to even garner the same type of breadth and speed of execution. Uh, on these articles. It's impossible for humans to do. That's where machines come in. And over the last decades or so, uh, there was a huge uh, progression or progress in how data is consumed and, uh, and read through machines and identified uh, sentiment-wise and even contextual-wise, uh, even for um, language uh, translation, it's all done through machine learning, very advanced techniques. You'll hear about those today. So the nature of this slide is obvious. Um, you need automation, you need a good, strong uh, technology to be able to take advantage and be able to consume all that massive amount of information that's coming through the news wires on a day-by-day -day basis, as a matter of fact, on a second-by-second -second basis. So uh, this is kind of what we are um, charged with doing, and uh, this is kind of why we have teamed up with Dow Jones Newswire. Okay, let's move on to the sector rotation. This is our first use case, and I'm going to have one of our quants, um, Tarun uh, uh, Bhatia, uh, will talk about uh, our approach, the technology itself. But for those of you who don't understand or know about sector rotation, uh, obviously there's a cyclicality in the market, whether it's days like uh, the most recent weeks that we've seen with a very high volatility, uh, flight to safety, as you know, but even during uh, the course of the nature of, of a calm uh, market, there is a notion of rotation from uh, risk assets, riskier assets to less risky, from uh, certain uh, type of sectors to, to others. And the idea is that if you can actually uh, ride the wave of identifying where money is flowing into or where money is flowing out of in an effective way, you can optimize the allocation of your portfolio to take advantage of these trends and actually consistently make uh, returns in any market, um, uh, including even the present market, as you know, everything is going down. Um, and obviously, we'll talk about how we hedge uh, these rotational um, um, ideas as well. So beyond just going long and start picking stocks, uh, we're going to look at uh, how we preserve those returns even during times in which there's a lot of uncertainty as we have today. Um, so the whole approach here is to go with a bottom-up approach. Number one, every sector has to have its own machine learning model. So think about new sentiment uh, at the sector level identifying within the sector which companies are in the news, which companies have the highest degree of positive sentiment within that sector that are shining above the rest of them, right? So this is a stock picking uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques 
to identify from the bottom up which stocks are the one to be chosen at the sector level. They have to outperform, not in, to, in, in absolute return, they have to outperform against the average of that sector. Because remember, we're gonna use the sector itself um, as, as a hedge against these outperformers. So the idea is to have a stock picking bottom up approach. At the end of that, we actually have also an aggregation at the sector level. So what is the sentiment of the entire sector? Because that's going to allow us to allocate um, more fund from the capital that we have in the portfolio towards that sectors uh, as a whole. So again, finding the winners, finding the overall sector uh, context of a trend, and ultimately, um, try to figure out a way how to uh, optimize the allocation of your fund to support that. And of course, at the end of that, how do we hedge our long only um, um, strategy with uh, some form of a uh, hedging for days like today when everything goes down, but again, you wanna go down less um, and the hedge will take over the absolute return to support that consistent sharp ratio and consistent returns. Anyway, enough me um, talking. Let me move on to uh, Tarun, who will take over and discuss some of our findings in these uh, following slides. Tarun, please uh, take over. Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, and thanks, Eris, for the intro to the sector rotation. Uh, I'm Tarun, I'm the lead quant at NeuroVest and have been here for since 2017. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and I'll be happy to help you. Uh, so for what we did over here, so for each sector, we created models and we backtested our strategies out of sample. Uh, and all of those strats you're seeing over here are all equally allocated. And all strats uh, outperform their respective benchmarks, which were the spider ETS. And uh, these backtests are inclusive of slippage and commissions. The average period a stock was held in this portfolio was 45 days. Tech had benchmark relative return of uh, 303% and a sharp of 1.08 versus 0.94 for the benchmark XLK. Consumer staples had a benchmark relative return of 392% uh, cumulative return and a sharp of 1.23 versus 0.78. Consumer discretionary had a benchmark relative return of 387% and sharp of 0.92 versus 0.71. Healthcare had a benchmark relative return of 201.4% and a sharp of 1.1 versus 0.9. Next slide, please, Eris. So over here, we see the other four sectors. Uh, this financial sector, we, again, we see the benchmark relative return, 220.7% uh, and sharp of 0.71 versus 0.63 for the benchmark. For utilities, we see the benchmark relative return, 82.1%, a sharp of 0.79 versus 0.66. Uh, for the benchmark. For materials, we see benchmark relative return of 156% and a sharp of 0.74 versus 0.56. For energy, we see a benchmark relative return of 82.6% and a sharp of 0.42 versus 0.28. In fact, in, in trading 12 months, uh, it has an information ratio of 1.71 and a sharp of 1.83 versus 1.56 for the benchmark. Uh, next slide, please. So here we are showing the correlation between the different strategies. So, and this correlation is during the period of 2013 to till 2018. The lighter the color, higher the correlation. The darker the color, lower the correlation. Energy and utility are the least correlated. Uh, you can see it's uh, 0.44 and financial and industrial are the most correlated with 0.87. Next slide, please, Eris. So now we applied uh, the optimization. So this is the first, what we did was Markowitz optimization with Efficient Frontier. So on right, what you see is a analyzed return versus analyzed wall plot. And the dotted line represents the Efficient Frontier. 
all portfolios under this line are not efficient based on terms of like their returns versus the risk they are taking. And the blue dots represent the individual strategies. Since tech had the highest returns, so it's plotted on the right side on the top. Uh, and the red star represents the portfolio with the max sharp. And the green star is the minimum wall portfolio. Here, the in sample annualized return is 16% versus the wall of 0.12, annualized wall of 0.12 for the max sharp uh, portfolio. And from here on, uh, we are interested in the max sharp portfolio. So now we will do so. This was in, 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 this, in sample 2013 to 18, but now we want to see if this works in out of sample. So in out of sample, the performance of the optimized tracks. Uh, so in the top chart, you see the individual performances. And on the, on the left, you see the sharp ratios uh, of the fund benchmark and the individual stats. On the right side, lower image, you see the performance of the fund versus S&P 500 ETF and the stats on the left. We do see a higher drawdown uh, in the stats, but otherwise we have a better sharp and a higher total return, but still we want to lower the drawdown. Now, the thing over here is this is based on Markowitz approach, so it only takes into account the historical values. Uh, but so next what we applied is a black litmus model, which will help us uh, predict like help us take in the future views. So what we generated, first we generated the forward looking views by predicting the future returns for each and individual strategies. Uh, and the like black litmus is basically a Bayesian optimization where our likelihood takes into account the future returns and our confidence in the future returns. So, now we see a much lower drawdown and a similar sharp and slightly better returns than the previous. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Tarun. Uh, this is Eric Davidson, our strategic partnerships for Neurovest. I've worked closely with Martina and our team at Dale Jones for some time. And uh, this is the volatility uh, portion of the webinar. So next slide, please. As most investors know, um, uh, managers, uh, retail traders, even professionals are not always rational. Uh, at times, they are prone to emotional decision making. Uh, in practice, that means chasing trends too far due to fear of missing out or panic selling at just the wrong time. Um, when investors become irrational, sentiment from news sources can reflect these far from normal states or deviations away from the mean, uh, and these situations tend to mean revert. Uh, and that can be a source of alpha for sophisticated managers. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Otar Sepper, the PhD and one of our quantitative analysts uh, to talk about um, the work in this space. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a senior quantitative analyst here at NeuroVest. I've been here since 2021. Um, my specialty is applications of machine learning and specifically deep learning to alternative data to make forecasts on both intraday and long-term horizons. And I'll be happy to address any technical questions you may have regarding the technology we deploy to construct our models. So I want to talk a little bit about the technology we use to extract uh, sentiment from the news articles. Uh, we have deployed a state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms in natural language processing to fine-tune our sentiment extraction pipeline. Our cutting-edge ExcelNet transformer architecture, which was first proposed in 2019 by workers at Google and Carnegie Mellon, improves upon the previously used BERT. Both BERT and XLNet are based on deep learning transformer type architectures. And more specifically, XLNet is what is, is called an autoregressive language model, which uses contextual relationship between words to make predictions. 
ExcelNet can be trained to learn associations between words in a sentence in the forward direction or going backwards. Thus, for any given word in a sentence, it will take into account both its left and right neighbors. It also uses permutations of sequences of words in a sentence to maximize the expected likelihood of a particular relationship between words. So ExcelNet is better than BERT in that it can handle sentences of arbitrary length, whereas BERT presets as one of its parameters before training the length of the input. So we're not limited to analyzing uh, titles or certain parts of the articles in this sense. We have fine-tuned the ExcelNet model in-house using our own categorization of news articles from Dow Jones by assigning positive and negative sentiment based on unbiased reading of the context and then training ExcelNet using this type of labeled data. The resulted predicted sentiment was shown to be much better correlated out of sample to the content of the articles as perceived by human readers. Now, for our forecasting model, the sentiment is extracted and aggregated over a period of time and cross-sectionally for many assets, and the resulting historical distribution of sentiment serves as a kind of a benchmark to classify a given day's cumulative mood in the market. We have shown, though, that peaks in the sentiment in either direction are highly correlated with volatility and can predict reversals in the market. For example, a highly positive saturated sentiment is a leading indicator of a downward move in the market and vice versa. Such predictions of regime changes are an effective tool that we use for portfolio construction and risk management. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is an example of a time evolution of returns following a market event. And in this particular case, it propagates over holding periods of uh, one to up to 45 days. Let's go to the next slide. So here we show a specific performance of a reversal-based strategy on a peak sentiment. Uh, we can see in this example, uh, a strategy that has a holding period of between one to 15 days, as well as the performance metrics, which show promising results, right? We see a sharp ratio of 1.3. It has very low drawdowns and it has consistent year-to-year -year, uh, gains. And we can always optimize uh, the strategy going forward. Um, so I'll be happy to answer any technical questions on our approach to modeling sentiment. Yeah, and guys, please, you know, uh, just type in your questions into the Q and A chat there, uh, and we'll um, we'll work to answer those while we're on the call. And we can also, uh, you know, happy to follow up uh, via email. Um, and for any interested parties, we're available to schedule um, a call uh, on these subjects with our quants, uh, and certainly regarding uh, the corpus of data that Dow Jones Newswire uh, has, you know, has shared with us that we continue to do work on. Uh, there's just a, a myriad of ways that you can take advantage of that, uh, and, and today's an example of a few of those, but um, there's there's certainly more than one thing that can be done, uh, both for short-term trading strategies and for long-term investment strategies. Um, and uh, so, you know, to, to summarize, you know, investors aren't always rational. Uh, they exhibit herd behavior. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's simple. Low information buyers and sellers push markets to extremes. And, uh, and and you, you, you have to have a beat on that. And one of the ways that you have a beat on that is is you uh, is you almost in real time um, keep a finger on the pulse of news. And you can do that with um, uh, with, with the Dow Jones news wires. Um, and there's a couple of ways to you know to put that into production. You can you can structure a volatility based standalone trading strategy like um, Otar just shared, um, or you can use this you know volatility factor. Uh, if, if we want to call it that, um, 
uh, as an input to condition longer horizon investment strategies, you know, for when you might, you know, risk on or size up or just the opposite, you know, size down and, and, and risk off. Uh, because what happens when, you know, these, uh, you know, when the big events come along, when, uh, when markets are pushed to, you know, uh, extremes in a, in a, in a uh, beyond normal way, uh, is when the regime changes it tends to persist for some uh, extended period of time. So uh, it pays to um, to have this as part of uh, your research arsenal, arsenal and have uh, it, you know at least signals if not strategies uh, around uh, this particular information. So um, I'll pause there. I will turn it back over. I will check uh, Q and A. And yeah. um, thank you, Eric. Uh, we have one question here from uh, Nick uh, Centrizos. Um, hello. Um, how was news used to in the sector rotation model? You take extreme measure of sentiment to trigger the rotation. Uh, that's a it's a good question. I think uh, we'll we'll basically let me take a stab and I'll let uh, Tarun uh, you know put on top of it. So the you know many of the uh, misconception about news articles is that they are short lived. You know a news comes in, it shakes up you know the the market. Uh, and then it dies because something else comes up. So the opportunities are short-lived. That's kind of what we hear sometimes from prospects that we talk to. And that's not true. You know, we've proven, as you can have seen in this presentation, that uh, we can actually take news and, and, and make a much longer term projections, especially when you look at aggregation of, uh, of information across multiple assets within a sector or within a market as a whole. So in the context of VIX uh, trading, where you try to uh, short the VIX or go long the VIX, uh, this is basically an aggregation of the entire market. You know the S and P 500 in that uh, in that context. You know what's the overall sentiment? You just average basically um, some sort of a uh, uh, mean uh, evaluation of the entire article uh, corpus of the of the entire market, and provide some sort of a weighting uh, technology to see which ones are more meaningful than others to add to the aggregate score. So in that case, we are looking for extremes, right? Uh, essentially rotation between um, risk on, risk off, over bearish or over bullish sentiment are usually reversing or reverting to the means. So that's the idea behind that. Uh, on the sector rotation, let me put um, Tarun or Otar on to talk about how we use uh, the data in that context. Exactly. So, uh, so as I was mentioned, uh, we do get signals, and these decide the entry and the exit points for the strategies on the uh, for the long term horizon in the sector rotation strategies. And uh, did we answer your question, or uh, do you have do you have uh, still some question, Nick? I think we answered it, uh, Tarun. Just just um, um, maybe you can talk about how do you apply the sentiment in the rotation, you know, in the actual optimization that we use with the black? Sure, human? sure. Yeah, yeah. So in the black litman, as I discussed, so what we do, we predict the future returns of the strategies. And again, the sentiment is used to predict the future returns uh, of the strategy. And that goes into the view, which is the likelihood of the black litman. And this uh, is used for optimizing along with the risk aversion from uh, from the previous historical return. So it's like the mixture of both, you can say, uh, for the black Littman model. Thank you, uh, Tarun. I think the next question comes here from uh, Valerie uh, Talma. Uh, thank you, uh, Valerie. Um, how did the system react to the news flow of the Ukrainian uh, Russian war uh, since February. What is their reaction in Russia uh, to Russians' announcements to mobilize uh, reserve forces, etc.? Et um, so I have uh, to say, you know, we we actually um, had three factors that were shown as risky at the end of last year, even before the actual invasion to Ukraine. There was a risk that there will be an invasion even before it took place. And uh, that puts um, obviously a lot of emphasis in taking risk off and, uh, and, and responding to it ahead of time. So there were really three, um, three major risks that we saw coming um, earlier than actually they, uh, they, they actually happened. Um, the first one was the Russian um, uh, war in Ukraine. 
there were signs even beforehand that there was a massment, if you remember, of forces on the border. The second one was uh, recession concerns. That was actually in the news even before we experienced what we have are experiencing now. And the third one, which did not materialize, but has a high likelihood of risk, is uh, China with Taiwan. Um, so these things are exactly the type of things that can give you that long-term view of, uh, of risks in the market. So, um, you know, uh, obviously the most recent uh, <clears throat> news about the um, call of the reserves, 300,000 soldiers on the Russian um, uh, forces is uh, newsworthy, but actually that's just adding additional confirmation to risk that we have seen coming through the wires way, way before that. Um, so thanks for that question. Uh, anybody wants to ask to, to add, uh, feel free. Okay, let's go to the next uh, question um, by Robert uh, Pashinsky. Uh, how do you handle this subjectivity uh, often found in sentiment? One person's good news may be another's bad news sentiment, resulting in variation in volatility versus stability. Um, let me take a stab at uh, answering that. Again, uh, Otar and uh, Tarun, feel free to, uh, to chime in. You know, so essentially the subjectivity of human is not really in contention here. We, we are completely machine learning driven, right? So what we do is we look historically at how news sentiment had affected assets. And that's how we obviously uh, extract information into the future if we see similar conditions um, in, in the uh, news article that are coming through the wires. But uh, maybe uh, Otar, Tarun, if you wanna add anything or Eric, uh, feel free. Um, yeah, thanks, Eris. I, I think I can chime in a little bit on at least on the technical part of it. Um, uh, Robert is right in asking about subjectivity of sentiment in general, because if we have to categorize articles into positive or negative sentiment, somebody would have to read them and assign uh, their own quote unquote opinion to it, right? But every kind of uh, analysis of uh, news or textual data is inherently noisy, right? But what we try to do specifically is to do it in an, as much of an unbiased way as possible by tagging one uh, words and sentences that are very polarized, right? So certain things uh, basically classify in buckets of extremely positive or extremely negative sentiment very unequivocally. So from that perspective, we try to reduce the noise. And also we use clustering algorithms that can help us automate um, this process in also an, an unbiased way. But in general, we should set the filter threshold to be very high in order for the gray area where the new sentiment can belong to either one of the categories, it, it kind of gets eliminated automatically in the process. So I hope that partially at least addresses the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Otar. We have a few more questions. I'd like to go through them pretty quickly. I think more there's two questions, and I'm not going to read them each one individually just to save time, about the, the terms time term of uh, the signals. There's a short term and there's a longer term. Um, also, there's a question about uh, uh, the, the efficient market hypothesis that actually says that there's three levels, obviously, but um, there it says that information is already baked in pretty quickly and market is very efficient to already address news as they come in. So let me explain a couple of things. I, I think the um, notion of technology uh, in some ways negate the notion of efficient market hypothesis. There is definitely opportunities for investment. Uh, and, and that's why, uh, as you know, some hedge funds make a tremendous living uh, from the ability to exploit uh, inefficient markets, right? So that's the, <laughs> you know, it's one of the uh, religious, um, you know, uh, uh, belief whether things are already baked into the price or not. Uh, but obviously the moves that you see now in the market are, you know, come, catching people by surprise. You know, there was a lot of uh, optimism about uh, the Fed's meeting and uh, you've seen the market gyrate going up and down pretty quickly uh, when things are coming out as a surprise. Uh, so um, we believe that uh, time to market, time to respond to signals is really important. You can do that with automation. 
uh, of course, and data. And that's really the key differentiator. As far as the terms, time terms, so we actually, uh, as we said in the beginning of the presentation, we actually have multiple types of strategies. We have intraday strategies that are much shorter. These are minutes or maybe uh, half an hour uh, max, you know, holding time within the day, you know, in and out. These are mostly futures based strategies. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, what we described today is much longer term, right? We can actually hold on to positions based on trends of sentiment. You know, sectors are rotating much slower than, than intraday. I mean, they're moving in formation for a much longer time frame. Talking about 45 days hold, 60 days hold. Uh, even the sentiment that we've shown you uh, on this webinar, in this webinar by OTAR, that was a 15, 16 day hold um, of the VIX using uh, either long or short uh, sentiment and and these things uh, obviously can change uh, with within the day, within the hours, within the you know day to day. But overall, these have been proven to be very very effective when you look at um, higher degree of uh, of trend formation or over uh, uh, bullish or over bearish sentiments that are reverting back to the mean in the market. This is what we are trying to exploit here. Uh, anyone wants to add? Please uh, feel free. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see one more uh, question here. Uh, the sentiment example looks uh, to fall into the investor overreaction, but not all negative news will make investor overreact. I want to know how negative a news will trigger an overreaction. Uh, that's a great question. Let me uh, um, uh, send, uh, send it to Otar, but essentially uh, the way the machine learning scores uh, there's not just it's not a binary score, buy or sell, you know, are we uh, going long or going short? There is a level of, um, uh, you know, uh, sentiment score as far as to the extreme sentiment of the article, but maybe um, Ota can touch on that. Yeah, I think Eris was pretty much uh, on the point there because we only trade the top deciles of any given uh signal so when once a signal is generated it is compared to a local historical distribution of signals and then it's a statistical process right every trade is not guaranteed to be successful but we do observe a high correlation with volatility indices and we know they're also uh, highly inversely correlated with moves in the market, right? So when we make a prediction, we improve our chances of success by trading, so to say, high quality signals based on our comparison of certain local historical uh, uh, signals from a backtest. Thank you, uh, Otar. Um, this kind of concludes our webinar for today. I appreciate everybody's everyone's time. Everybody stayed on on queue here and stayed on uh, on the webinar, even though we are in an uncertain time, an easy time. But you know, these times provide for some some folks opportunities. And you'll see when we get the report for this quarter, you'll see some of the hedge funds have done tremendously well utilizing these uh, big moves in the market. Um, but in any event, I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, any questions, anyone wants to ask uh, more specific uh, questions about their situation, we're happy to answer. Uh, and I wanna thank also our partners from Dow Jones Newswires, uh, and they are very actively involved in our research. It's really uh, quite incredible to have such a support from uh, an incredible team at the Dow Jones. So I wanted just to thank them and provide some, uh, some uh, you know, color onto the relationship um, Otar, um, thank you so much for your help. Tarun, uh, just as well. Eric, Martin, everybody have a great day and uh, stay safe. Talk to you soon.